Hello, everyone. Good evening, and uh, I just want to welcome each and every one of you to our broadcast. Today is actually going to be an interview. Um, my name is Kyle Griffith. I am the founder of the M&A Alliance and managing partner of the NYBB Group. We are an M&A advisory firm based in Melville, New York. Um, today, uh, we're going to have a, a great conversation with a colleague of mine who's also a member of the M&A Alliance. We're going to talk, be talking today about how to be prepared for eventual litigation uh, before and after COVID-19. Okay, so if you're new to the MNL Alliance, uh, we essentially, we are a group of trusted advisors that provide different types of advice to CEOs that are looking to transition, um, either they're looking to acquire or buy a business, or they just need advice in general um, in regards to M&A merger and acquisition activities. Okay, so um, today we'll be featuring one of our trusted advisors, um, Mr. Douglas Lieberman. He is a business litigation expert a litigator. Uh, he also is very, um, very knowledgeable about business contract law. Okay, so um, Doug, can you hear me loud and clear? How are you doing today? I'm doing okay, Kyle. How about yourself? Awesome. I see we, we all like hunkered down, right? This whole week, I mean, uh, past month actually, right? I mean, with this whole COVID situation, it's definitely yeah. been an, it's definitely has been an um, interesting experience for for everyone. Yeah, it's definitely been uh, new and interesting for sure. Yes. Yes. So, um, I mean, today we're going to talk about litigation and, um, you know, I'm actually just to kind of hear from you. I mean, first, I kind of want to hear more about, I want you to kind of share with us more about your firm um, and your, your background and everything, and then we can get into the content. It's going to be a short, you know, unlike our previous forums, uh, we scheduled to go about till about 6.30. So if you have any questions at all, um, just make sure that you, you know, submit it in, in the chat. In the chat area and then we can make sure you get those questions answered um but we have a lot of content to cover and um, i got some questions for you doug so if you're ready to rock and roll we can um get started um, sure. I, I just want to like for you to share you know a little bit about your, your your background yourself and your and your firm if you don't mind sure uh so i um am a graduate of hofstra law school 1986. um i had got my uh, bachelor's degree uh, from Plattsburgh, SUNY Plattsburgh. I uh, have a master's um, from University of Maryland and then my law degree from Hofstra. Um, Hofstra is where I met my partner. Um, we both uh, graduated the same year. Uh, before we formed our firm in 1990, uh, I worked for a, a small firm uh, in Manhattan, um, which as it turns out, uh, one of the partners there uh, happened to grow up on the same block that I did in Belmore, which is how I got my interview because he also graduated in one of the first classes at Hofstra. Um, so we worked there for about four years. Um, and then um, we um, we then, um, you know, uh, opened up the firm. Um, it Currently, uh, there's myself, my partner, uh, two associates, uh, as well as um, three paralegals and a receptionist. Okay, bear me once. I'm getting some feedback from the chat that folks are not hearing us communicating. Um, it's, um, if you uh, if you guys are hearing us, just hit a thumbs up. There's uh, some icons in the the top left there. If you're hearing us, just give it a quick thumbs up. So so Kim, I know you responded that you weren't hearing us. So um, okay, great, loud and clear. Thanks thanks Winnie Andrea, appreciate the feedback. So, um, so Hofstra, eh? so um, local, local college, right? Eh? University. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, that was one of those where was, I grew up in Belmore. So after uh, being away for six years, I got to live at home for three years um, <laughs> and, and, and go to law school. Uh, so um, that was interesting. Awesome. Awesome. So many of the at attendees here, the CEOs of, of companies, um, they want to know, you know how they can prepare themselves in case they are sued. I mean, that's and it is a topic that most people don't want to talk about. At some point, you may be sued or you may be uh, suing another party. So in a right. case that, you know, how can someone prepare themselves initially from just prevent themselves, themselves from being sued? Uh, some so, things they can do. Yeah, I mean, in, in, in a general sense, you know, uh -huh. one thing that you have to think about is, uh, unfortunately, lawsuits happen. You know, um, whether you want to sue somebody or, or you know, you happen to be sued, they, they just happen. Um, so, you know, one thing that you really need to keep in mind is that um, you, you, 
first always should have an open mind that if you're going to sue or be sued, that you should be trying to settle the case. I mean, even if it's a case that you think is the most ridiculous thing in the world, the fact of the matter is between the time and the expense and the aggravation, it's just not worth going through a lawsuit. So you know, you always should think about settlement um, because it's, it's just better for everyone. Um, the only way, I shouldn't say the only way, but you know, I mean, I have clients who, because of their position, they always fight only because it's one of those things where, you know, if if they settle too quickly, uh, then that may hurt them in the long run, just because then everybody will start suing them because they know they're kind of an easy target. Um, but but otherwise, you know, settlement is definitely uh, uh, something to think about right away. Um, you know, something else that you should always do is, you know, you should when when you everybody has contracts. So make sure that you read them when you start out, you know, when you first, uh, when you first sign a contract, make sure you read it, make sure you know what, what was going on going in. Uh, and also keep in mind dates that are in there. Um, you know, so there may be certain trigger dates, or there may be dates where you need to make sure that you, you send certain notices. Um, for example, like in uh, a lease, you know, if you have an option to extend, um, usually it has in there that you need to exercise that option by a certain day. Well, you know, you want to know that before that date comes and passes and you say, oh, you know what? I think my lease is coming due. Let me check uh, when I need to extend. And you found out, you find out that you should have done it three months ago. Um, so if you make a record you, on your diary calendar system, you know, put in those dates, that's something that, uh, that you can do. Um, something else that you need to remember is that, you know, emails and texts, um, are real documents, you know, they count, so to speak. Um, and so though they come across as being, um, you know, uh, less, um, you know, less important than a letter, um, is they are not, they are just as important. Um, and so you have to be careful what you put in an email and what you put in a text um, because, you know, they, they do count. Um, you also, as far as for um, corporations or, or LLCs, you know, there are certain formalities that need to be maintained. You want to maintain those formalities. Um, so, you know, like a corporation, we have plenty of clients who, you know, corporations, we have their kits, the kits are sitting on our shelf and they've been there for years. And even though they're supposed to have annual meetings, uh, yeah, not so much. Um, but, you know, again, you know, it's something that you really should do because if you get sued, it is possible that uh, you know, the, the other side is going to ask for copies of your minutes or your annual minutes or you know, your records. You're going to want to make sure that they exist. Um, mm -hmm. So, so those are just some you know, really broad, general things um, to to think about and keep in mind. Yeah, in regards to the contract, is it one item of a contract that's that you see that's overlooked constantly? That, well, that's, uh, yeah, I mean, many many times, you know, people uh, you know, don't don't realize when certain things are supposed to be done, um, or or you know, notice that needs to be given. So, it, it, uh, an example. We have a number of clients who own restaurants and that kind of thing, um, and they have uniform contracts, you know, for their workers. Well, many uniform contracts have language that kind of says that the contract is for a certain term, and then it automatically renews um, unless you give notice, you know, and it's usually 60 days, 90 days before the end of the term. Well, most of the, the restaurant owners never look at that. And even though they say, I'm paying too much or I'm not getting good service, they don't give the notice they need to give in order to terminate that contract. And now mm -hmm. the contract renewed and they're stuck and, you know, and they try to do something and it's too late or they just say, uh, your service is no good, I'm not paying. And now they're being sued, you know, for, and usually those contracts say that they could be sued for the entire, you know, over the course of the term, how much the uniform company would receive for the entire, the entire period. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. things like dates are definitely things that you, you know, to keep in mind. And that's why I said, you know, if you, if you can diary those or put them in, in your calendaring system up front, to at least, you know, going in, uh, you know, when those dates are going to pop up, that that's something that's, that's helpful. 
I mean, it's, it's a big thing. Some people, they, they, you, you sign contract and you just put it away. I've had an issue with a, with a client that actually had a, it was a partner dispute and uh, in that in their contract didn't have any non-compete, whereas none of the, the partners could not um, circumvent that agreement and bring business in from another um, entity. Um, and you know that created some some issues within within the within the partnership. And uh, when he looked at the agreement, his their, their agreements it didn't have that in there. Um, so he's you know, absolutely. And, and yeah, the, so yeah. I, I actually am dealing with a situation now kind of yeah. the other way where the client uh, didn't realize that he has a restrictive covenant that is for 10 years and 50 miles. Um, you know, so it's a lot broader mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. than he anticipated. He didn't even realize that it was in there. Um, mm-hmm. I'm sure it was explained to him, you know, first time through. But um, you know, it was something that uh, they didn't pick up on, and now now it's an issue. Yeah, let's talk about um, employees. Um, you know, what 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 can uh, uh, a CEO do to better position himself so they don't, they can't they can't get sued or protect himself from getting sued from an employee? Well, a big a big claim um, that employees make have to do with wage and hour claims. Um, you know, that they weren't paid either minimum wage or they weren't paid overtime or, you know, you can spread time, uh, depending, uh, those, those are, those are usually big claims. Um, so you, you really need to keep records. Um, and it's important that you keep records, um, preferably time cards, if not time cards, time sheets. Um, but, but you really need to have, uh, the proof of when the person worked. And the reason for that is the way the statutes are worded is uh, basically it's that all the employee needs to do is say, I worked, I worked a lot. You know, I mean, I worked 60 hours a week. That's basically the complaint. You know, uh, I worked 60 hours a week. That's all he needs to say. Now the burden has shifted to the employer to prove he didn't work those 60 hours a week. The uh-huh. easiest way of doing that is having the time cards, having the time sheets, having something in writing to be able to prove that he didn't work that because if he can't, the employer screwed. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, and, and I, I've had a number of cases uh, where I've represented employers um, where the employee has made these, uh, these allegations and because their record keeping was poor, um, you know, we, we settled um, because the way the statute is worded, uh, you just the, um, the, the damages because it's, Double, you know, the, the penalties are, are the same amount of, uh, as to what the hours would have been, you know, had you paid them. And it's just very expensive. It's, and then they, they, you would have to pay the, the employees' attorney's fees. It's just not worth going through the, through the litigation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, I, I, so that, that's I, something I, to take, watch out for. Yeah, I, I know there's a big, there's a big issue now, and we, we probably get into it. It t- ties into more to COVID where, um, you know, what's the best way to you know, terminate an employee, you don't want to um, discriminate or you don't want to, um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like a catch-22 situation because obviously people are trying to survive, they're trying to, you know, take care of their families and stay healthy at the same time. And we are seeing where some employees are taking advantage of the system, like they don't want to come back to work per se, right? They were let, let go, they were furloughed or, or they were laid off and, and they're, they are unemployment and essentially they don't want to come back. Um, for an employer that's actually looking to you know, terminate an employee, what's, what's the best way to go about that just to make sure that you kind of cover all of your, your assets, so to speak? Well, so, so you want to make sure that, you know, obviously before any of this, or even you know, just as you, you operate generally, you know, you, you have your employee files. And again, you keep records, you know, record keeping. Of of things that went on, you know, whether there are any um, issues with them, um, you know, if they didn't do this, didn't do that, you know, but but really have good records. Um, and so this way, you know, if, if it's an employee who really wasn't um, doing their job, and there were you know uh, warnings and that kind of thing, you know, then then you know, there there really uh, should not be a claim for any discriminatory uh, basis for for their being terminated. You know, you you had a legitimate basis. And, and when they make the discriminatory claim, you know, you, again, you have your file to show that, hey, wait a second, you know, they didn't do this. We warned them. They didn't do this. We warned them. They didn't do this. We warned them. Um, you know, that being said, that doesn't mean that they're not going to make the claim, uh, you know, saying, wait, I'm over. You know, I'm, I'm in the protected class. I'm 60 years old. 
you know, you fired me. That's the reason why you fired me. Um, but you know, in situations like we have now, if, if a company winds up terminating, you know, 15 employees, because they just can't afford to keep them on any longer, you know, and and those employees cover the whole spectrum of ages of people. You know, it, it's going to be much more difficult for them to be able to make out their claim that the basis of their termination was because of their age. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about accidents in the workplace. Like, what can a uh, com- uh, business owner do to assist or present, prevent prevent um, suits in regards to accidents? employees in the workplace okay so um you what again make sure you maintain the you maintain your premises keep records maintenance records you know if you uh, have the if you have a supermarket let's say you know and you and they uh sweep or they mop whatever certain times keep records of that um also have um, a, a system where if there is an accident uh, how that's going to be reported um and make sure to get a report uh, when that happens. Um, if you have, uh, surveillance cameras, um, and I guess this cuts both ways, but if you have surveillance cameras if, and, and you know, you get a report of an accident, save the tape, you know? So this way, if someone says you, know, they fell by the apples and it turned mm-hmm. out that, you know, there was nobody standing by the apples, you've got the tape, um, by the <laughs> same token, you know, if they say they fell by the apples and you see them slip on the big puddle of water that was there for 10 minutes, Right. Uh, then, you know, maybe you better settle. Uh, mm-hmm. So, um, and also, you know, make sure something like that, you you would also hopefully have your, your, your liability insurance, um, which would then, you know, cover those, those types of situations. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Also take photos. I mean, look, you know, everybody has a camera now because if they have a phone, they've got a camera. And so, you know, when they fall, they're taking pictures. So you, you really ought to do the same thing. Right. And I just want to remind everyone, if you have any questions um, for, for Doug, just you know, drop it in the chat there. We'll make sure we get it answered. And if we don't get to your question, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to your questions. But if we don't get to it, I'll put an email address in there where you can submit your questions to if we don't get to it by the time we sign off. Um, let's talk about litigation as it relates to COVID. You know, what are some types of litigation that can come out as a byproduct of the, you know, of the, COVID, the COVID pandemic? All right. So a couple of things that I think um, are are going to come up. Uh, One of them uh, is going to be with with insurance and whether or not everybody's losses are going to be covered under their business interruption insurance. Um, I mean, I think that's going to be a big one. You know, um, the the way that the policies are worded, you know, there's particular language um, in order for it to be covered. It's you. Most of them are uh, direct physical uh, loss or coverage is kind of the language that's in that policy. And the question becomes whether or not the virus fits within that definition. Um, you know, there are you know, some cases um, out, you know, that, that you could kind of argue would say that it does. And obviously the insurers are saying absolutely not. You know, this is not something that's going to fit within the coverage at all. So I think that's something that, that there's going to be a lot of litigation about. Um, also, just in contracts, you have this whole issue of, of performance of contracts and whether or not someone was able to perform um, and why they weren't able to perform. Um, you know, most contracts have, it's called a, a force majeure clause, mm-hmm. which is basically it allows for an excuse for performance. Um, but those clauses are read very specifically. It really depends on, on the language that's in there as to whether or not that's, that's a basis to excuse uh, the, the non-performance. Um, you know, you, you also have the idea of impossibility. You know, if someone uh, was supposed to you know, deliver certain goods and they've been closed because of the, the executive orders, uh, arguably it's been impossible for them to make a delivery of those goods. Um, and so, you know, they now may have a defense uh, if they're sued because the goods uh, were, were not delivered. Um on the employee side, like we talked about, you know, you, you're going to have people who, who uh, are not um, you know, rehired who very well may make claims uh, that the, the basically they weren't rehired because of, you know, discriminatory basis, you know, because they were too old or, you know, for or they were a woman or whatever it was. Hmm. Do, do you have any indication of when? I know the courts are closed now, right? Um, 
Yeah, ba- basically right, right now. Um, mm-hmm. So other than emergencies, um, and there's kind of a listing of what's deemed to be an emergency, um, you cannot start uh, a litigation. Um, you can't start a case if you wanted to. Um, they have uh, a couple of weeks ago, they started where they, they were starting to hold basically video conferences um, for pending cases. Um, so if issues came up that you needed to speak to the judge, you can contact them. You could set up a conference. Um, there was actually an order that came out today that next week they're going to allow um, documents to start to be filed again. Uh, right now, uh, you, you know, even if you had a pending case, if you had to file something, you couldn't. The clerk wasn't accepting it. Everything is e-filed. Um, so the clerk just wasn't accepting any e-files at all unless you had a judge basically saying it was okay to e-file. But it looks like starting next week, uh, they are going to start accepting um, documents again. So cases will now start uh, start moving on. Um, but but just uh, landlord-tenant, though, is still closed. Um, mm-hmm. So the, you know, still, you know, we can have all those issues um, coming up, you know, where tenants haven't paid because they're not able to pay. There's still the moratorium that, uh, that's in existence. Uh, but you know, at some point, you know, all of that is going to start having to shake itself out. Mm-hmm. I, I know, I know, it's, you don't have a crystal ball, right? But you know, do you think judges would side more on on the, on the consumer in this regard, or you, so, for example, in a false majority case where you had a, you were able to perform on a contract because of COVID? you have any indication of where, what side of the scale you think the judges might be on? Because it's such a gray area too, right? In yeah. And, and I, I really think like something like that, because it is so contract specific, I really think it depends on, on the language of what's in there. Um, and I, I'm trying to remember the specific language, but I have a client whose lease had a has a force majeure clause in it, and, and um, Doug, for those who don't not familiar with force majeure, you mind just explaining what a force majeure is? It's basically it's it's just really a legal term, and and basically what it has to do with it 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 relates to excusing performance under a contract. So the clause would say something along the lines of you know uh, in the event of you know an act of God or um, you know blah 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 blah, it lists certain numbers of things. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, the, uh, the uh, party um, it, it does not have to uh, perform under the contract, generally. Mm-hmm. Th- right. that, that's kind of what, what, the, what it is. Um, so in this particular lease, it, the, the way that this was worded, um, it, it kind of um, included viruses. And so, you know, it kind of said right in there that the, the tenant was excused from performance under the lease as mm-hmm. a result of, of a virus. Um, right. So we, we're, we're taking the position that, you know, they don't have to, they at least for now don't have to pay the rent. Not that mm-hmm. they will never have to pay it, but at least for now they don't have to pay it, uh, you know, regardless. Interesting. Interesting. Um, you have anything else to add before I um, start taking some questions from, from the attendees? Anything else that we didn't, we didn't cover? And there's a, there's a lot of oh, questions. Oh, I don't know. I only, I, I, yeah. yeah. I, I only have five pages of notes, so, you know. Five pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, you know. it, it, it's like folks have like a, lo- a lot of questions about uh, it, it, how to handle employees coming back to work. Um, we just jump right into the Q and A section here. I do have a question. Um, uh, says, do you believe that there will be an increase in buy sell agreements litigation cases? Um, there could be, and and again, it really depends on the uh, on the language in that contract um because you're right there very well could be buyers who are now having cold feet i'm sure kyle you may have seen the same thing you know buyers may start having cold feet and now they want to get out of their deal um well you know it's not going to be so easy just to say hey because of everything that happened i want my down payment back you know it's really going to depend on the language that the language that's in there um and just because of this it very well may not be enough. You know, I mean, just because of this, it may not be enough. Yeah, a, a lot of the negotiation has to be done, uh, you know, up front. You don't want to get to the get to that point, have to go back and try to negotiate different items in the contract. Um, so 
in a case like that, we want to have that handle up front, especially with the PPP. If it's a case where um, the the business is going to be getting fund, and that fund comes in after after close, you have to stipulate in, in the contract that the buyer have to use those funds towards payroll. So I mean, so that has to be identified in the contract. Um, one other question: How will valuations play a role, in your opinion, when it comes when it comes to litigation? And I don't, Steve, you want to reword that, but that's how I got it from you. How will valuations play a role? Yeah, I'm not. I, you know, as yeah. far as for damages, I'm not. I'm not quite sure what what you're asking. Okay, so if if Steve want to resubmit um, that that question, we may definitely try to get that answered. Oh, damages. So, um, hmm. so yeah, I mean, you know, if if you've had a pending, so if there's if you have in the middle of a lawsuit now. Um, and, and regarding, you know, uh, if it relates to a business, like, let's say, for example, you know, you have someone, uh, two partners who are in a dispute, um, you know, as to a buyout kind of thing. Um, yeah, you're right. I mean, right now, you know, the, the business value is, is taking a huge hit. Um, and, and, you know, what, where they may have thought that they were going to get, you know, $200,000, six weeks ago, <laughs> they may only be getting $50,000 now, um, mm -hmm. which gets back to the idea that we started with as far as, you know, sometimes you, you got to settle, you know, yeah. sometimes you, and you really need to make a business decision. You know, you got to, you got to make a, a, an informed business decision, not with your heart, but with your head. So I mean, it's, it's an interesting time because, of, you know, just going back to the M&A part of this, I mean, um, Companies that are thinking about going to market, going to sell, or if they're already, already on the market, they have to really ask themselves the question that, um, do I want to go through another recession? Do I want to hold out till, let's say, next year uh, and see what I can get for my business then? Or should I make considerations now? I mean, that's a, a, a big question a lot of business owners have to answer. Does it make sense to wait until next year to sell my business? Uh, nobody knows when this is going to end. And... I think in most cases, when you deal with COVID and the health situation, your health comes first. So if you deal with health issues or you just want to retire, you just don't want to, you know, don't want to go through this anymore, you know, you may pay more, put more weight in on that. Um, as far as buyers, um, this is like a, a perfect opportunity for buyers to buy companies. Number one, for two reasons. One is sellers are making a little bit more concessions. Um, and they're willing to cooperate. Um, at the same time, if you're a buyer looking to buy a business, you have to be very understanding and be empathetic as far as what that, that, that the seller is going through in their situation and not to take advantage. Um, and it's from a finance perspective, I mean, their SBA has some great programs for buyers right now that are looking to buy a business where they can defer, not defer, right? The, the IRS, the SBA will actually make your first six months of payments. So it's, a, it's an interesting time we're in right now with a lot of uncertainty and hopefully because of this we don't see too much litigation i mean as an attorney you know that, that, that you know that that's kind of what you do but i just hope that there's a more folks have a, have a moral compass and we can all um communicate i think when there's a breakdown in communication that's where you see all of these um litigation uh, i mean even with landlord tenants i mean they just stop communicating and then you just create unnecessary problems, you know? Yeah, I, I, I would also think that because of the way this is, that you probably will have cooler heads prevail for a little yeah. while. You know, I, I mean, you know, and, and you kind of saw it a little bit after 9-11, how people kind of were all, you know, they got along much better up to a certain point, you know, right. and then everybody kind of went back to normal. And I would imagine that this is going to be the same thing. Right. So, Dar, I really appreciate your time. Um, I know you have a lot of it now, right? <laughs> you're, you're yeah, out of the office right. and, and the court is closed. So I, I think I got you at the right time. Um, uh, we'll be doing another one next week that's going to tie into the, the commercial insurance piece. So that's on, on Tuesday if you want to tune in for that. We have a couple of events um, that's going to be coming up um, on the 14th. We're doing talking about financing. And um, on the 19th, you can talk about contingency plans, how to prepare your business for hopefully not another recession, but in the case something like this comes back around, at least you're prepared. Um, I definitely want to thank you, Doug. I really appreciate your time um, and educating us on litigation and different types of litigation and what we can um, do to protect ourselves. Um, I, want to thank I want to thank each one of you for, for attending. Um, 
Doug, what's a good way that folks can get a can get a hold of you? If if they want to shoot me an email, uh, my my email address is d m l at m l e s q dot com. Got it. And uh, all of Doug's information is actually on our website. So if you were to go to um, the m and a alliance dot com. Um, all of Doug's contact information is there, as well as the other advisors that make up the alliance. All their contact information is there as well. So I want to thank each and every one of you. Uh, we will send you a quick survey. Just we also want to get everyone's feedback um, so we can make these um, events big better um, next time around. Okay. Thank each and one of you, and uh, have a great day and stay safe.